Uh, so just to give you a little bit further information about my, myself, I'm a partner with the law firm of Blank Rome. Uh, we are a large law firm. We have over 500 attorneys. We have about 100 attorneys here in the Watergate building. Uh, I, I am strictly a patent and trademark lawyer, although with 500 lawyers we have uh, people who practice in every area, um, corporate, maritime, uh, bankruptcy, mer uh, mergers and acquisitions. So we're a full service law firm. Uh, we also have offices in New York, uh, Los Angeles, DC of course, Philadelphia, uh, and Beijing, or Shanghai, one of those. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to talk primarily about um, patents and trademarks, but before we get into that, I'm going to cover a couple of areas that are kind of generic to all startups and uh, just areas that I've seen working with startups of, of potential pitfalls or areas that people can prove or that um, can help them knowing about before they start their business. So uh, just here are a couple of random thoughts. And I'm not going to go through my slides word for word. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything that's in there. A copy of the slides is, is going to be available on the uh, GW Business Plan website. Yeah, and uh, if anyone needs a copy, you can also email me. My email address is up there. It's w-e-i-s-s-m-a-n at blankrome, B-L-A-N-K-R-O-M-E dot com. I'm happy to send you a copy. So a couple of things, you know, people, people know about this, but uh, sometimes it's hard to impress that you really do need to budget for uh, legal concerns with your business. No matter what type of business you have, you're going to have some sort of, you're potentially going to have some sort of uh, legal issue, whether it's exporting, importing, uh, trademarks, patents, or the like. You, you, you should sit down and think about what kind of budget do I want to create. And the best way to do that, of course, is to speak to lawyers get a sense for what type of issues you might have and what kind of cost might be associated with that. Um, various type of things that people might not think about are you know, dealing with not only the different types of government, but um, product liability insurance, other types of insurances that your company may have or may need to have in order to do business. I have up here recognize your strengths and weaknesses and I like to talk, when I talk to uh, people who are just starting up their own business, maybe this is the first business they've had and maybe they're sitting in business class and the person next to them seems like a real, you know, car salesman, uh, you know, they can sell the Brooklyn Bridge, they're real, you know, energetic and they go out there and they um, can, can raise interest in, in just about any product they have. And, and what I want to tell you is, um, you know, I deal with a lot of people who are uh, CEOs, they started their own company, um, and, and I see the full range of personalities. So not, you know, very few people are the typical car salesman, if you will. Um, and I have one client in particular who is very slow, he's very methodical, he talks slowly, and about 30 years ago, he gave up his job at a large pharmaceutical, mortgaged his house, not once but twice, went into business for himself, almost went bankrupt, um, and he was not a salesman. He was, he was just a basic guy and you know, he was a researcher. But he le believed in his product, he found the really niche market, and he pursued it. And uh, today he has, I think, 300 employees. So it's, you know, by, by me experiencing all the various types of people are, that are out there, don't think of yourself as, as you know, if you can't, if you're not someone who can sell, then you partner with somebody who can. If you're not strong in technology, then you may need to partner. So that's actually, I think, the sign of a good leader is somebody who not only recognizes what they're capable of, but what they're not capable of. Another area I like to, to talk about is your attorney as a business resource. So like I said, it, you know, you, you not only have to create a budget, which you may want to talk to several attorneys about what would be an appropriate budget for what I'm looking to do. But your, your attorney can sometimes be a source of referral for you. So let's say um, you know your type of business who needs a warehouse and you're not sure what to do about finding a warehouse, you don't know how to find it, what's a good area, you know, should I be looking in Maryland, Virginia, DC? Well, 
you know, we have attorneys who negotiate leases. They do it all the time, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they, they not only know the, the area, but they could put you in touch with uh, a real estate broker who specializes in commercial space, maybe in, a, in warehouse space, and they can make a connection for you. So, um, so, so people don't often think about that. Uh, you know, some of our existing clients will sometimes uh, find out that they're doing something and will say, hey, have you thought of, of this or have you talked to this guy at my firm or um, tried this area? And sometimes we can make a connection, sometimes we can't. I like to sometimes think of it as kind of a LinkedIn on um, supersized LinkedIn, or I used to say LinkedIn on steroids. So uh, not only is my firm myself, but I have 500 attorneys. So every attorney knows who their client is, and they're looking to make deals for their client. They're looking to build relationships for their clients. Because if you guys succeed, <coughs> then I succeed. You know, the, more, the, the better off you do, the better off we do, frankly. Hey. So, um, so if you do need something, and it's kind of an unusual request, you, you know, I've had people ask me, um, you know, I'm looking for someone who specializes in this type of marketing. I email my 500 friends, and they know CEOs, CFOs, they know everyone at, at these co companies throughout the world, and they're looking to build a relationship for their client. And I'm looking to help you, right? Because if, if you find the right connection, great. Uh, you know, you'll remember that. And you may have a legal issue. So, um, so what I say is LinkedIn and steroids. It's 500 people who are interested in helping you out. So, um, so that's why I say you know, your attorney can be not only a legal resource, but a business resource. A few other things that are kind of generic to startups. Uh, people, you know, often hear of, you know, having some sort of agreement between the initial people who founded the company. You may have two people, you, you may have three or four people who say, yeah, this is the greatest thing. We all, we got, we got to quit our jobs. We got to quit, quit school and we got to do, do this 100%. And in the beginning, everyone is interested in this company. I mean, they want to do it. It's going to make them millionaires. So, uh, you know, everyone's going forward, and all of a sudden, after six months, people realize, oh, I got to test, I got to study, I got to do homework, I got to go work, and people lose interest. So, um, I've had it several times. I mean, it's just the natural process. You're all friends or something, or you all have some relationship together, and then after six months or a year, one, maybe two people just aren't participating the way they used to. So it's always a good thing to have at the inception, as early as you can, some sort of understand, understanding between the founders. Uh, what, what do we expect from each other? What are you going to do? How much time are you going to invest? How much money are you going to invest? What expertise do you bring to the table? Maybe you can even set some milestones that, you know, by such and such a date, you're going to have so many leads or something. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, instead of everybody on day one saying, okay, there are four of us, Let's, let's do 25% each. Instead of that, you could think about, well, how about we have an ultimate goal of 25% each, but we don't get that until a certain, amount of per certain period of time progresses or um, certain goals are reached. So after a year, maybe you'll get 5%. After two years, you'll get another 5%. Uh, and that way, if relationships fall apart, as they sometimes do, you don't have someone who owns 25% of the company who's no longer long doing anything with it, but kind of you know, holding you up or holding up the other people who are moving forward with the business. Uh, online legal forms, you know, there's a lot of websites out there, LegalZoom, et cetera. So uh, sometimes those, those can be okay. I mean, you know, everybody's going to have financial challenges and you have to you know, spend your money the, way, the, way, the best way you think is, you can. Uh, forming an LLC is something that's relatively cheap. Sometimes LegalZoom, you don't have to go through LegalZoom, but I do find that they make it a little bit easier to understand. Filing a trademark may be a little bit easier to understand, but you could also do those directly through the state websites or through the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, using legal forms like a non-disclosure agreement, those are fairly standard. Uh, sometimes 
rather than giving an agreement to someone, you can say, hey, do you have a form that you typically use? And they'll, they'll give that to you. Some people don't like to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, it's always a good idea to run everything by an attorney, but you, know, you have to do what you have to do. The real danger with negotiating your own contracts is that you don't know what should be in the agreement. And you also don't know what shouldn't be in the agreement. So it may sound reasonable to you, but even, even small variations in the language might, might be unfavorable to you or might be unfair or not conventional. Um, and you also don't know what should be in there that isn't in there. You don't know what you don't know. So uh, you know, oftentimes an attorney can look at it and within a matter of minutes say, you know, these, these are the issues you have with this agreement. Um, yeah, as you, you know, certainly as your company grows, you want to try to have an attorney go back and look at some of the forms you've created, maybe some of the agreements you've entered, uh, check through your trademarks, see whatever you've done on LegalZoom as far as your business goes, and, um, and help you bring that up to, to par. Are there any questions about just general legal matters? Yes. Can we even drill down on our agreement to what happens if one of us assassinates the other? Is that okay? <laughs> so I'll repeat. I'll, 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 re I'll, I'll repeat questions just for the camera, but I, I don't know if that was a rhetorical question or just a comment. But um, yeah, I mean, it, certainly when you do a, an agreement, um, of how the founders are going to share a company, I mean, you can't go to an attorney for everything, right? Because you, you're not going to have money to, to start your business. So whatever you write down on paper, try to do the best you can and uh, try to set forth the terms that you think are reasonable. And, um, but, but you know, keep in mind this type of a vesting, they call it a vesting schedule, where your interest in the company vests over a period of time. Uh, and I have that up there. So the next part I'm going to talk about, is I'm going to run through a few types of business structures that are out there. Uh, probably people are familiar with them. And like I said, I'm not a corporate attorney, but I've gone through this a number of times that I understand some of the basic concepts. Uh, so if you have questions, we can try to answer those. But if not, um, and you wanted to talk after or uh, you know, at another time separately, feel free to email me and I can reach out to one of my corporate attorneys to help us out with this. So the, ma the main reason for forming a company is to insulate, li insulate you from liability. <clears throat> so let's say you know, you in your personal life, you own a Dodge Dart and you, know, you have a cat. <coughs> so if you do something in your business and you're operating by yourself, and you run into some sort of trouble where somebody comes after you, pursues you, sues you, says, say you're negligent or you breach a contract or something like that, they're going to try to latch on to whatever assets you have. So they're going to come after your Dodge Dart. They're going to come after your cat. No, maybe not your cat. But um, so what you want to do is form a company uh, in order to insulate you from that liability. So if you have a company in place and you're doing business as ABC LLC uh, and something goes wrong, and there's a product liability suit or whatever it is, they can't come after you in your personal capacity. Now, the, the exchange for that is that you really need to, um, you need to honor that form that you've created. You need to honor that company structure that you've created. And I'll get into that in a second. What, another very strong uh, reason that you should form a company is to help you establish ownership of the things that the company owns. So you go out and you buy a computer, right? Uh, and maybe a friend paid for it on their credit card, but it's for the, for the business. Well, who owns it, right? You, you, you don't know. I mean, you don't want somebody to leave the company and think that they own some of the assets. So any of the assets you buy, you should buy through the company. So if your friend's going to pay on their credit card, reimburse them from the company or um, get a company credit card. If you own a patent or if you own a trademark, assign it to the business. That way if somebody walks away, they're not taking that patent with them. So it not only applies to tangible assets like you know, a real estate, like if, you're, if you're renting a, uh, an office space or if you 
have a computer or, or whatever it is, but it applies, to, it applies to intangible things. If you have an agreement with a customer or with a distributor, the agreement is done with the company. So that way, you know, somebody walks away and you're not left with uh, an uncertain relationship. So as I mentioned, you need to abide by the responsibilities of having a company. So you have to maintain the, f the formalities. You can't, you know, like I said, you can't go out and buy the computer in your own name. You have to run it through the business. Uh, if, if an action is brought against your company and it's determined that you, you just had the company but you never did anything with it, the agreements in, were in your own name or the patents were in your own name, uh, you know, they may say, okay, well, you lose the privilege of insulating you from liability, so your dodge dart is once again on the bargaining table. So basically, uh, your company should not just be a shell. You should really do things. You should get an, an account for the company. You should uh, get an email address if you can, although that's, you know, not necessary. Uh, but you want to you wanna make sure that you don't commingle your personal funds with the funds of the business. If you buy something, reimburse yourself with a company check. So a few, comp a few types of companies, sole pr proprietorship, th these, don't, these don't necessarily protect you from personal liability. You really want to form at least a limited liability company. I'm sure people have heard that term LLC before. It's very popular. It's very easy to form. You could do it, even DC has, uh, you know, if you go to their website, you can figure it out. It's not that complicated to do. What's more important about an LLC is having, <coughs> having what's called an operating agreement. And that's the whole, you know, that's a five-page uh, document that says these are who the people are, this is what you're contributing, uh, this is what your responsibilities are, uh, this is what happens if someone leaves, etc. So that's a more onerous document to prepare. Um, but just setting up the, the <coughs> excuse me, setting up the LLC itself can also be useful. The LLC will protect you from, uh, insulate you from personal liability. There are, there are several other types of companies that people have heard of, S, S companies or C corps or uh, um, S corps. Excuse me. Um, you know, there's no, there's no, people are always looking for what's, what's the best one to do, right? And, and you look around uh, and nobody's telling you, should I do an LLC, should I do C Corp? And there's really no best that fits everybody. You have to figure out, you know, what, the, the, the thing that drives it the most are what are the tax implications of this? <clears throat> In which way am I going to pay the least amount of taxes? So it may, it may benefit you to do an LLC, it may benefit you to do a C Corp. Um, you know, again, if somebody was struggling with what they should create, uh, feel free to give me a call and, and we could talk to one of my corporate attorneys and we'll figure out what might suit your, your particular business. I put some, just some notes up here that are uh, you know, some of the general features of, of these types of companies. A nonprofit organization is something that has to have um, a purpose which is not to, to make profits. So whenever you do own profits, earn profits, they go back into the company. Now that doesn't mean you can't pay yourself as, as you know, an officer of the company or as a worker for the company. You certainly can do that and, and we all hear about uh, CEOs who are making millions of dollars at, at nonprofit organizations and how can that be. So you can pay yourself, it has to be reasonable um, for, for the work that you're doing. There are various types of nonprofits. Just because you're nonprofit does not mean that uh, you can accept charity or that it's tax deductible, charitable donations. Uh, these are very, actually, these are um, difficult companies to form and they can take uh, several years to do. <coughs> so it, it would be hard for you to do on your own, something that um, you really would need a lawyer for. That's the bad news. The good news is that some of the large firms, like, like my firm, if you're truly a, um, a nonprofit organization and you have a real good social benefit to it, a lot of large firms will take, take on a client like that as a, not, as a pro bono client. So um, 
It just has to go through additional uh, requirements that, that my firm puts in place or other firms as to what they're willing to do. Yes? Actually, I found it fairly simple to do this. I've done it a number of times for various groups. And it takes a minimum of 100 days to get the uh, 501c3. Um, and I've, I've been pretty successful at being able to do it. So it is possible for people who are strapped for money to go ahead and get 501c3 status. Yeah, so the question is. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, it's, it may not be, the question is whether uh, 501c3 status is hard to get. And there, there are different levels, but to get to a, a full charitable deduction, non-tax, uh, non where you accept charitable deductions, <coughs> can, can take quite a while. I've been through that process, and uh, it's not always easy. Yes? Um, two questions with that. I know I work with my former church, but for nonprofit. I, is the rule still that you can, I guess from formation, you can accept money for like, I guess, 24 months? And that it can be, I mean, like if you're going through the, you know, sending to the IRS or whatever, that you can take up, it can take up to 24 months to where you can still claim that the person who gave the money can still claim it as a non, um, non-profit deduction. Um, that was the first question. <coughs> the second, I know last year, I think they started going to B Corps. I'm not sure if you are knowledgeable as far as the B Corps thing. Yeah, so the question was, uh, you know, again, the period of time that it takes to be able to accept uh, money. And I, I would have to defer to our, I mean, we have this, a few people at our firm who are specialized not only in corporate law, but in nonprofit um, companies. So I, I don't want to misdirect you here, but if, if, I mean, you can always accept money. But whether whether the person who's giving the money can claim it as a tax deduction on their tax forms, uh, you need to make sure that that's all in order. It is retroactive. Uh, I'll accept your word for it. Apparently, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll move on from here. Uh, turning to intellectual property, does anyone have just general corporate questions before we move on? Again, if, um, you know, if people are struggling with exactly what type of business they're interested in, I'm happy to help them out if they want to give me a call. Yes, Lars. Uh, I'm not familiar with the B Corporation. You know, so the thing about companies is that they're dictated by state law. So um, a, lot of a lot of states have LLCs, but that doesn't mean that all the LLCs are the same, and it doesn't mean that the legal uh, that the laws that apply to them is, are the same, and it doesn't mean that the rules and regulations that they follow are the same. They, they differ from state to state. So it can be important to know which state to go into. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you're not going to go wrong with, with um, you know, uh, picking, choosing an LLC in a particular state over another. Uh, they're probably fairly similar. People, people know that Delaware is a common place to go. There are a number of advantages of going to Delaware. Um, so the, the thing about Delaware is that you have to have a presence there. So what people will do is they will hire a company which will serve as its agent in Delaware. Basically, it's just a mailbox in Delaware. So you will organize your business. And even though you're doing business in DC or Virginia or Maryland, you'll have uh, a place in Delaware that can be served, processed, and other things like that. So that that will cost you a few hundred dollars a year, maybe three or four hundred dollars a year, just for that mailbox. Yes? We're thinking of taking subchapter S elections for the first year or so if we're losing money, because then the losses would flow into our individual taxes. Have you any experience no, with I, subchapter I, S elections? Uh, I'm, happy to talk, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards, so uh, if you want to, I can set up a call with one of my then corporate. When you start Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'll turn to intellectual property, and I'm going to cover three things here, patents, trademarks, and copyrights, and also probably a little bit of uh, trade secrets. So most people uh, have heard these terms, but they may be a little confused as to the differences between them. Uh, so I'll start off with the patent. 
A patent is, a, as I defined up there, but basically the Supreme Court said that you can patent anything under the sun. Now there's also been uh, some, some discussion later as, uh, lately as to software patentability. A Supreme Court case came out a couple months ago and the Patent Office has been rejecting a lot of the software cases. Uh, my personal view is that the, the Patent Office has taken a very broad uh, reading of the Supreme Court case that came down. Uh, but I think the pendulum is going to switch back. I think that the Patent Office is going to become a little more lenient in things that they've been patenting. But historically, the U.S. has been, uh, been willing to um, patent software. So I wouldn't discourage people from looking into that if that's uh, part of their business. And it can be an important part of their business. But there are a couple of other types of patents that you can get. You can get not only a patent for uh, the product itself, but the method. If there's a method of making it or a method of using it that's different, um, you can do that. And you could also get a patent on a design. If it's an ornamental design, it doesn't have a functional feature to it. Uh, it's something that's aesthetic to your product. It's possible you can get a patent for that. It may be that you should get a trademark instead. and. Um, there can be some nuances between that, but that's something that we could help you out with. So what, it, what it's clear, though, is that, uh, you know, like I said, the Supreme Court said you can patent anything under the sun. What's clear is what you cannot patent, uh, which is sometimes easier to define what you can patent, is you cannot patent an abstract idea. So you can't just patent the idea of selling bananas or something like that. It has to be something that has a specific implementation. People often say, oh, I'm going to go out and patent my idea. You're not really patenting your idea. You're patenting the implementation of your idea. Um, yes? Well, no, if you have an idea, and you have an idea clear, and you invite the idea, but you didn't yet go under the ground to implement it, at this time, will you, you be able to have a patent for that? So the question is whether you have to implement your idea before you can patent it. And the answer is no. And uh, it, it used to be that, hundreds of years ago, it used to be that you had to actually submit a working prototype. And if you go to the patent office, they have a museum there with all these old prototypes of little cotton gins and stuff like that. Uh, and they're, they're interesting to look at. But that, that's no longer the requirement. So uh, as soon as you have an idea, if you feel that, it's, uh, that you have it in a, fair, in a shape that you think is commercializable, you can apply for a patent. Um, the, the, the struggle is that the earlier, you, the earlier you file your patent, which is, is good, you want to try to get an early filing date, uh, you know, as you continue to develop that product or that idea, you may revise it. You may make a lot of changes to it. So it, it can sometimes be uh, you know, a, a question of when should you file for your patent? Should you file on as soon as you have the concept? Or should you file after you start thinking about it and working on it and trying to reduce it to practice? So the closer you come to reducing it to practice and figuring out what's the real commercial embodiment of it, um, it may be a good idea to file then. So one, one strategy you may have is to do both. File early and then update your patent later. And, we could, and we'll touch on that a little bit. So I, I actually have a very good handout, well, I, I think it's very good, um, of it, it deals with patent applications, and I go through things that you need to put in your patent application. Uh, but essentially, you have to describe your invention with as much detail as possible. And, and the test is to enable one of ordinary skill in the art to reproduce it. So that means in, in late, so lawyers come up with a lot of fancy language because we have to justify our, our rates, right? So I can't just tell you the easy answer, but I'm going to tell you the easy answer. So th the difficult question is, is what you, you know, you're paying for, is you have to describe it in an enabling manner so that one of ordinary skill in the art can reproduce it without undue experimentation. The, uh, the lay, ans lay person answer is you have to make it so that someone understands what your invention is, and, and they can build it if they wanted to. So there, there has to be a lot of detail in the application. Uh, so uh, again, here's the, um, here's the 
the answer of what the test is for patentability for, you know, when you come to me and I, have, and I tell you that my hourly rate is exorbitant, this is the test that I tell you is that in order to get a patent, it has to be obvious to one of ordinary skill, it has to not be obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art at the time of the uh, invention. Uh, and people often think, wow, a patent. You know, you hear about a company having a patent. It's a very powerful marketing tool, isn't it? You hear about a new company, and, it's, and my father, you know, st looks at the stocks all the time, and he calls up, and you know, he doesn't call me about this anymore, but he used to call me and say, oh, they have a patent. And I'm like, well, it doesn't mean anything. You have to look at the patent. You have to read it. You have to understand it. Because not all patents are, are put in by Einstein. Einstein isn't filing any more patents. So, it, you know, it doesn't have to be a tremendous breakthrough. And, and here is the simple answer. What, what does my patent have to be is, you know, how do I get a patent is, does it provide you with a commercial advantage, right? And isn't that all you really care about anyway? Is it worth me spending the money for this patent application? So remember I, I told you before, you have to build your own budget. So as part of that is you shouldn't be afraid to ask questions about cost because, and, and, and as an attorney, I always tell you the cost because I don't want to tell it, I don't want to pretend it's going to be cheap and then send you a bill that you can't pay. It doesn't do me any good, it doesn't do you any good. Um, so does it provide you with a commercial advantage? A patent application can cost, depending on what the invention is, $9,500 to $17,000 just to prepare and file it, right? So that's a lot of money. And now you see where it comes in, right? It, and it's. It's any kindergartner can think about that. Well, it's ten thousand dollars. I'm never going to make my money back on that. I'm not going to file it. Or there's a million dollars idea. I, ten thousand is nothing. I'm going to do it. So it, it kind of answers itself. Uh, and, and that's that's my layperson test. Is um, that that that's my um, every kindergartner knows what you should do. Kind of answer is that is it worth the money? Uh, as I mentioned before, and, and this can be very important, we've had a lot of issues with inventors who once they, you know, once the company starts taking off, they never assign the, the um, patent to the company, and lo and behold, you know, you're successful and everybody's coming out of the woodwork. And we have, we've been in positions before where a company is selling off uh, to another company, it's being acquired, and the patent isn't assigned. So we've, we, we prepared two documents. We prepared an assignment, and we prepared a lawsuit. And we had a service agent show up at the door of the inventor and say, you're going to sign this, or you're going to get sued. And they signed it. So you don't want to have to deal with that, right? You want to do it. You want to get these things tied up as early as possible. You want to have your vesting schedule as early as possible, because once, once your business takes off, everyone you know, sees, sees the rainbow, and they want a little piece of the pie. So, and they get more aggressive about, I'm not going to do this, and it's holding you up, and the investor is not going to invest because they're waiting on this person. And then you got to throw a lot of money at it, right? So, can end up costing you more money down the line uh, than taking a, a advantage of it in the beginning. Did you have a question? So the question is, how do you know if your patent is really defensible or, or worth anything? So the good news is, uh, when you file a patent application, and if you're using a lawyer, you have someone who's been doing it for 20 or 30 years like myself, and they've been through the ringer a lot, and you know, they're going to get you the best possible protection they can, and they know that somebody one day is going to look at the patent and decide how, th how can they get around it. And the bad news is, when somebody wants to get around it, they're going to hire their own attorney, and they're going to look to see how can I get around this thing, right? So defensibility is a very tough question. Uh, wh even when you go through the patent, so when you go through the patent process, the, pro the patent office tries to find prior art to knock down your patent. 
but that prior art, I I even after the patent office issues the patent, anyone could still, still look for prior art. So if you're going to assert it against somebody, I, I mean, it, they could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars looking for prior art. So the defensibility is a very difficult question, but it's something we do all the time. I mean, we, like I said, we go through due diligence pa phases where an investor wants to invest in it, or uh, a company wants to acquire a, a, the business, or whatever it is. And when you're going to that, through that process, Whoever's acquiring it, if they say, if they're saying, the pa you know, they're going to sign. How important is this patent to the business? Either it's the whole business, or maybe it's not not really that important. If you have a product on the market, who cares if you have a patent, right? Really, if you, it, you know, I'm a patent attorney, but I'm not always in favor of patents, right? It's not always the most important thing. If you build your business, uh, you have a concept of a great idea. All right, that's going to give you some value. You file an application, that's going to give you some value. You have a patentability search done. You, 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 know, you look around. You, we hire somebody to, to find prior art. Nothing else is out there. You know, so these are questions that an investor is going to ask you. They're going to say, have you done a patentability search? What type of patent did you file? Did you file a provisional, which we'll get into? Or did you file a full application? I know I'm getting way beyond your question. Um, so you know, as you go through this process, you get a patent. That gives you more value more value is assigned to it. But really, if you have a patent or you don't have a patent, your company, uh, it, it, it's also going to depend on um, how many customers you have. Do you have exclusive relationships with distributors? Do you, you know, what, what, is, the, um, what is the value of, of the people? What, if, you're, if you're bringing in a revenue, um, who cares if you have a patent, really, right? Now, People are going to say, well, I don't want to invest in your company if you don't have a patent because someone else is going to compete against you. But you still have the first mover, you know. So what if you make, you make some money and you have to move on? Um, or if you make some money, sometimes the best, um, the best thing you could do is to have a problem, right? If somebody's suing you for infringing their company, for infringing their patent, or somebody, somebody sees you, that means you're doing something right because you've gotten someone's attention. So oftentimes people say, oh my gosh, somebody else is doing this, they're coming after me, whatever. You can often flip that around. So many times I've seen it where somebody's coming after you for infringement or whatever it is, and they want to buy you because uh, you know, they end up purchasing you or buying your patent or licensing. So you know, sometimes in these times of trouble, uh, you can turn them into an opportunity. So I don't know if I quite answered your question, maybe. Sure. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what kind of information should you show to an investor? And the answer is, it's sliding scale. I mean, day one, somebody approaches you to, uh, you know, says, uh, I see, you know, you say you, it's patent pending. What is it? I mean, day one, you don't lift up your skirt, right? Uh, you say, well, yeah, I do have a patent application pending. And they say, oh, when, when did you file it? Well, you know, they have to show a little more interest before you start giving them the filing date. Then maybe you want to give them the, 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 um, the drawings and not the full application. At the same time, if they're seriously interested, you show them everything. Because that's the only way you're going to get them to invest in your company is if, if, if they really know what you have. And I mean, we've been on both sides of the, this. Like I said, you know, uh, they say a lawyer in a small town who's all by himself goes bright, broke. But two lawyers in a small town, they're rich, right? Because, every, because now everyone's suing each other. So, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so that's the same thing through these due diligence processes. If, if I have an investor who's looking to invest in your business, I'm going to want to know what, what you're holding up. 
You know, what, what, what value do you really have? And we've looked at patents and we've examined patents and we've, you compare it to what's in the market, you compare it to your product, what your competitor's product are. So if you've done a, a search or you've commissioned a search through a, through a professional, there's, there's going to be a report, you identify the patents, uh, but all that you give to someone in layers and you'll have a confidentiality in place or you have uh, a memorandum of understanding or an intent, uh, some sort of a document that shows their intent to acquire the company. And um, I mean, it's just a sliding scale. So don't ask me questions because I have lo long answers and I'm <laughs> going to answer something that uh, you didn't ask. Um, but investors are interested and, and they know. Uh, you know, apparently the, not on the Shark Tank they don't know or they ask beforehand. But you, you bump into an investor and they know. They know that people file provisional applications that aren't worth very much because that's what they have to do. So they want to, they really want to understand. You say it's patent pending. Well, show it to me. Or, or what is, what is you, what did you file? A provisional. Well, how good was it? Did you, did you uh, pay for a lawyer or not? Um, you know, and like I said, a patent isn't everything. It's, it's, an a, it's one asset. It does give value. It has a lot of market perception. It shows that you as your business, you're thinking about it, right? You're thinking about the right things. And what's a, a, you know, an investor comes to you and says, um, you know, you're, you're out there, you're giving your, your um, business plan pitch, and you're telling everyone how unique your, your concept is, your business, nobody's done this before, it's a real niche product, I love it, all I have to do is tell people about it, they're going to be knocking down my door, and the investor comes up to you and says, I love your presentation, where's your patent? What are you going to say? Uh, what, what are you going to say? You can't say, I couldn't get a patent, or um, you know, it's not worth patenting. You just told them how unique it is. It, you have, you know, if you don't have a patent, it's sending across a mixed message. So um, it, it gives a huge market perception, as, as you know, people know that you hear that a company has a patent, you think they've done something innovative. What do you mean by cross-licensing? Um, oh, set up cross-licensing technology. So if you have a patent and somebody, you know, your competitor says, oh my gosh, this, this company is really taken off, I better do something, I'm going to sue them. Well, if you have your own patents and they want to do what you're doing, then you may be able to cross-license your patents. So, and I apologize, I, I didn't uh, repeat the question. So the question was, what, what is the opportunity to cross-market by having your own patents? So the answer is, if you have patents and somebody, a competitor sues you based on their patents, you can potentially cross-license each other. And I've seen it both ways where, uh, you know, client, uh, some of our clients have said, I, I like these people, their, their patents, I'm going to sue them. Right? They're setting up a cross-licensing opportunity. Um, you know, so, so bad things that happen aren't always bad. Sometimes they're actually good things. Um, I'm not going to go through everything. If, if somebody sees something they want to talk about, that's, that's fine. Uh, territorial. So patents are territorial, which means that if you have a U.S. patent or a U.S. patent application, you could only sue somebody. You could only exclude others that are making, using, or selling in the U.S. or importing or exporting. Uh, if somebody is making something in China and selling it in Europe, you're going to need to have a patent in either China or Europe. And, and uh, you know, just filing in, in the U.S. is expensive. Once you go outside the U.S., uh, costs really get expensive. And Did you have a question? But if you have an, an IO or if you file a patent in the U.S. For, for a product, and you want to protect it uh, in other countries, because someone may see it in the U.S. today and go implement it, how you can do to protect it? You have to file it here and in other countries also? Yeah, so the question is how do you protect it in other countries? So, so, once you so what happens is once you file in the U.S., uh, you, there is a period of time by which you can file in other countries and claim priority back to the U.S. application. Now, uh, I haven't gotten to it yet, but um, 
the big the big danger is you well, uh, I'll get to it in a minute um, as to what it is. But once you file in the U.S., you would then also have to file in other countries, China or Europe or wherever else that you want protection. So, you know, people always ask me, um, you know, they say I'm an English major. It's going to cost $10,000 to file this application. I'll just write the whole th the thing myself. Or they'll say to me, what, what if I prepare the application and you just review it? How much will it cost me then? And, and the answer is, or, or you know, they say, can I, can I do it myself, basically? That's the question. And the answer is, no, you can't do it yourself. It's ridiculous. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being a little just in, in just here. But, but, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been training, well, m longer. I'm not going to tell you how long. Um, I train, I, I, I don't write uh, many applications anymore myself. I train associates. So I'm a partner and I have associates who work for me. I don't, I don't want me to be. Um, but uh, it will take a new associate two to four years to really start to understand the patent process, how to write an application, um, because it's not English. You may know English, but this isn't English. This is, you know, this is technical. So, so, for instance, uh, let's say you invented a bottle, right? Um, how are you going to describe this in your patent application? Well, it's an oblong thing. It has a cap on top. It is an opening, and it holds liquid. Well, that's not enough information. You have to describe the ribs. You have to describe the, uh, the bottom being, having, having um, uh, a recess portion which assists in the pre in to, to resist pressure. It's tapered at the top. It comes to a cylindrical top, and uh, it has a circular cover which is threaded and fit. So it, it's not English. You wouldn't understand. It's not to mean that you, you're not capable of it, but it's a very um, refined process that you have to go through. And even though I put in my hand out, or even though I'll tell you, you have to describe the invention with as much detail as possible, you're not going to do it. And I, I, I've offered to Lex, um, I've said anyone who wants to prepare a, a provisional application, I'm happy to review it. And I, I can look at the application, it'll take me 10 minutes. I could even tell you now what you're going to do wrong. Not enough detail, right? So uh, if, you've, if you're putting together a software application, you need hardware, uh, you need a hardware embodiment, you need um, flow diagrams. But I could tell you without looking at it that you didn't do it right. Um, and I, I'll give you pointers on what you should do, what needs to be put in there, but more and more detail. And I haven't reviewed an application that I haven't had questions about. And if I have an associate who comes to me and says, you know, I finished the application, I don't have any questions for the inventor, I, I said, well, you've done something wrong. You didn't, you didn't understand the invention. But uh, no matter, we have inventors for our large companies, they filed dozens of applications. I continually, you have to pull the information out of them. They'll send me a, a diagram and there'll be a little notch in there. And they won't say anything about that notch. And I'll say, well, what, what's that notch for? What, why do you have that there? And they'll come out with this whole story, right? Oh, man, that took us six months to design that thing. I, you know, we were having all problems. It wasn't uh, connecting together. And the, it wasn't working. And it, you would slide and this and that and the friction, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, why don't you say anything about this thing? So you know, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? So, the fact that, he, that they were working on that means that it could be something important. Now, not always, but sometimes. So even people who do it on a regular basis, they don't always appreciate that what they're doing is patentable or, or something that should be described in the application. Yes? Yes. So the, yeah, so the question is uh, to just discuss a little bit more about ornament, ornamental patents, which are actually they're called design patents. And as I mentioned before, it's for the aesthetic look of the, uh, of the product. And again, there doesn't have to be a huge distinction over what's been done before. And the test isn't necessarily one of obviousness. It's one of an ordinary observer. Um, and 
<coughs> it's uh, it, it, it's hard to, to say. I mean, the only thing that you put in a design application are the drawings. And, and actually, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I, I believe that a lot of these patent you know, companies that were ripping people off, all they were doing were, were filing these design applications. And they're much cheaper to file because all they are are drawings. Um, and it's not a full description of the invention. It doesn't cover the function of it. So the function is, is where the real meat lays. It's, it's the real important aspect. But not always. I mean, there are some businesses that are just kind of better protected by uh, design patents. So I think uh, shoes, like Nike, I think, uh, um, has design patents and stuff. So even shoes can be. So I, I wouldn't rule out design patents. And I, I often think about them because they're, um, you know, the, they're often overlooked, and it could be something that's important. So I, I don't think I've given you much help, but, but I would encourage you, if you think you have something that's aesthetic, search the, you could search Google Patents, or I, I prefer the Patent Office website, uh, which I have at the end of this, uh, just because I'm old fashioned. But you could search Google Patents and look for design patents um, and, and put in the title or something. Is there a question? Yes. trying to make like a better version of something that exists like say like a phone case which is pretty common um like what usually happens in that case so i mean i mean there's like a ton of companies already out there like otterbox or like life group which are like i guess all similar somewhat so like if say like you have your own version of like a phone case uh -huh. so so the question is i i guess how do you know if yours is really patentable over what other people are doing and that's the real, the real test. I mean, patentability kind of breaks down into two areas. It's one, is this patentable subject matter? But the answer is almost always yes. The, and the tough question is, is it patentable over what others have done? And that's the commercial advantage test that I propose to you. But it's basically, if yours differs from what your competitors are doing, and it provides you with some benefit, right? I mean, that's, that's the decision you need to make. Now, an examiner could. Once you file an application with the patent office, the examiner could take you know, A, B, and C prior art and patch them together to kind of reconstruct your invention, if you will. Um, but I mean, it's a tough choice. I mean, the answer you should come to is, if it's providing you with some advantage, don't discount doing a patent, even if you file a patent application. I mean, the, the problem is, if you don't file, you may lose the ability to, to do so later. So it's better to file. I mean, you know, costs and everything else uh, granted. Um, it's better to file and take a shot. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, uh, rather than, uh, you know, having that mixed message that you would send to an investor. Uh, so provisional application, there are two types of applications. is provisional and, you know, con conveniently enough, a non-provisional. So non-provisional, I just call full application because I just think it's a little silly to say provisional and non-provisional, and I, uh, you know, people mix them up. So a provisional application is is a much cheaper way to go because it doesn't require all the formal uh, things that a full application does. <clears throat> but the the issue with a provisional is that it expires in one year. It doesn't become a patent. It's not even examined. So you file it, and you just take whatever information you have and you file it. Now, you want to have as much information in there as possible. And you could prepare, prepare a full application and just file it as a provisional. There are certain strategic reasons you might want to do that. Uh, but basically, it's not a full application. You just file it as a provisional. The filing fee at the patent office is a little cheaper. Our fee is much cheaper. We'll charge $500 to $2,500 for that. And the reason I give $25 as the upper limit is because if we're going to go over that, we might as well just pull put together the full application for you. So um, you know the problem with the, the provisional is that you've, you filed your provisional, and now you start disclosing the invention. And then all of a sudden, it's time to file the full application. And you've disclosed all this information that isn't in your provisional. And it can become a problem for you. My preference is always to file a full application. But you know if you don't have the money, or if you're going to be disclosing the invention soon, uh, a provisional may be uh, the way to go. 
Uh, patent strategy, and this is, if there's, if there's one takeaway today, it's this. And this, again, is something you, you could go to just about any kindergartner and ask them, and they'll tell you, right? You have this great idea, oh, it's going to make me millions of dollars. I'm so excited about it, I'm going to get the product out there, oh, I can't wait. What do you do? I mean, you're just busting, right? You, you want to you get this, you want to tell the, the world, and you want to start making your money. What's the first thing you do? Right? You don't tell anybody. A kindergartner knows that. You have a patent, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Don't go blurb, blabbing about it because of this, the statutory bar. And this is what they pay me the money for, is to tell you the complicated explanation of that. Once you disclose your invention, meaning you told somebody about it or you disclose it in, in one of these ways, once you disclose your invention, you have one year to file an application in the US. But, and this is where the foreign stuff comes in, most other countries don't give you that, what we call the one-year grace period. Most other countries, as soon as you disclose your invention, you can't, I mean, you could file in that country, they, they might never know about it, but you, you lose the ability to go into those countries. So uh, the best thing you can do is to file an application before you make any disclosure of it, and that will preserve your rights, not only in the US, but elsewhere. But if you say, oh, I've already, I've already disclosed it, what do I do? Uh, then you, ha you do have one year in the U.S. and some other countries give you a six month gray per grace period and some give you a year. Not that many though. Most important countries uh, do not give you any grace period. So what, what do we mean by disclosure? I mean this is a legal term. It has to be complicated, right? We can't make an easy, an easy answer here. If you call me up and say, oh, I've done this or I'm going to do this, is this a disclosure? I'm going to say, yeah. I mean the best thing to do is to file before you do anything because that's the safest routine. There are hundreds of cases about people disclosing and what's a disclosure and is it, is it a publication, is it a commercial use, is it a, an offer for sale and you say, oh, I've only told one person about it. That can be a disclosure. People often think it has to be public, but it doesn't have to be public in the sense that a lot of people know about it. Even if, you know, if you go to a, to a speaking engagement, you go to a trade show and only two people show up and you tell them, well, that can be a disclosure of the invention. Now, every, the complicated part is that not every country has the same definition of disclosure. So what might be a disclosure here might not be a problem in Europe. So you know, um, if it was easy, you wouldn't have to pay me. So um, again, the strategy is file in the US before you disclose anything. That's the easy answer. That's the thing you know, lawyers are going to want to say. Um, but if you have disclosed it, may not be the end of the end of the day for you. Uh, maybe you have improvements. Maybe you have other things that were not disclosed. You can still file an application on that. Here are a couple of things, uh, you know, s things that are somewhat particular to uh, being a student or being a researcher that type ways that you might disclose thing if you have a NSF grant or an application, et cetera. Uh, that can be a disclosure, so you want to be careful of those. Um, discussing it is in class, probably not a a problem because people are under expectation that your students, your learning, there's, you know, you want to keep it confidential. Um, but, you know, the safer thing to do is to file an application before you start talking about it. Certainly, if you're in the business plan competition or Pitch George uh, and you make it into the finals and you're going to be presenting it and it's going to be webcast, uh, you want to make sure you have your application on file beforehand. Did you have a question? has to be in your speaking at the business plan competition to, to qualify as a disclosure. I say I have a process for turning lead into gold. Is that a disclosure? Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, you know, what if I'm not really making much of a disclosure? And that, I mean, that's, that's the rub. I mean, if, if, you get, if your disclosure is non-enabling, and it can be, you know, we've had a client who put a, a small blurb in a trade publication for a seminar that they were going to go to, if that if that is really non-disclosure, non-enabling, meaning you know, it's another legal f term we had to come up with to to ch you know to justify ourselves. Uh, if it's non-enabling, meaning someone doesn't understand what you're doing, basically, right? That's the kindergartner explanation. If if you really haven't said anything, nobody knows. I mean, what do you mean you're doing this? They either think it's false or they have no idea what, how you're doing it. How are you turning uh, water into wine? Um, 
then then it may not be a problem. So you're right. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, Yeah. You can you can use a pattern. You can find a pattern for that, or it is just for this. So the question is, does it matter on the type of use that you make of it if it's personal versus business? So it's kind of uh, I, I don't know if you're coming at me from two two directions, but as far as the disclosure is concerned, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it you, whether you're disclosing it or using it for personal reasons. So if you if you develop a better bike seat and you use start and you put it on your bike and you're biking around. That could be a disclosure of the invention. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're intending to commercialize it or not. Um, you know, and five years later, you say, I want to patent it. You may have a problem. I mean, you know. Yeah, I think I did ask for it. For example, if I have a project, how to help people get out of poverty, but I'm not doing it for business. I'm doing it for non-profit. But it's my idea. Mm -hmm. Right. So, the so the question is, does it matter if you're doing it for a nonprofit reason? And the answer is really no. I mean, as far as the disclosure goes, it, it's a disclosure whether you're making money off of it or not. Now, whether it's on sale could, could relate to, so there are several ways that you can disclose it. One way is uh, a sale or an offer for sale. Now, if it's experimental, that, that's where that kind of comes in. If you're making an experimental use, uh, that might not be an offer for sale, but if, if you're, if you're, even if you're giving it away, a sale doesn't necessarily have to be for money. Uh, so the answer is, it doesn't matter if you're doing it for a nonprofit reason or a profit reason, and also a nonprofit could get patents just as well as a for-profit company. <coughs> Patent pitfalls. So you know, clearly, even our large companies, like I say, that that we do work for, and they are. Um, filing patents all the time. I mean, well, I'll go to their facilities and we'll walk around and, oh, what's that person doing? Oh, this is great. You should, well, you never told me about this. And, uh, you know, so it's realizing that if you're trying to solve a problem, necessity is a mother invention, right? You, you have a problem. You have to fix it. You have to do something. If you're trying to solve a problem, whether it's, you know, uh, for a nonprofit reason or, or otherwise, the solution you come up with could be patentable. Uh, whether it's software or hard or you know product or or method, um, you know we all have problems every day, right? If you think about it, you think, oh, this is such a pain to do it this way. Why do, why do people do it this way? You come up with a solution. You made it easier. You've you've streamlined something. You, you can get a patent. Um, uh, don't delay. Of course, you want to file before you disclose the invention. The U.S. has gone to a first-to-file system, meaning it's a race to the patent office. Whoever gets there first has priority. You know, if we, if you, if you, if you come up with an invention and say, "Hey, I'm going to file a patent," and you file a patent next week, and a company has been researching this for two years, and you file first, you beat them. You win, right? You get you get the earlier filing date. That's one advantage of being small: is that you can uh, you're a fast mover. Yes. Why did the, so the question is why we went to first to file system. Um, <laughs> my, my personal feeling is because that's the way the rest of the world has been doing it. Um, I don't want to say who who's knows more about patents, but I think we're trying to come in line with the way the rest of the world does things. Um, so we're adopting some of the ways that they do it rather than them adopting the way that we do it. Yes. I mean, um, I mean, I guess my question would be that as a writer, um, I realized this was an undergrad name moments ago, that supposedly the poor man's copyright was to mail something to yourself, so that, and that would be a miscellaneous court of law. But I guess with patents, like, say, 
any given grocery store, which may have generic cereal or generic soda, which I'm not assuming like Coke or Kellogg's has a particular patent on how they make stuff. But I mean, I guess if you come up with something and somebody copies off of that, I mean, I guess if you can prove that you were in the marketplace first, I mean, is that still hard to prove without the patent if somebody rips you off, but you know, it's clear that you're in the marketplace first? So the question is, uh, you know, what types of ways can you prove that you invented something earlier? And, and I mean, this comes into play when you approach somebody and you want to do a non-disclosure. It's always better to have, um, in my opinion, um, it's always better to at least have a provisional application to establish your filing date or the date that you knew of something. So if you're going to go so, to somebody, and again, you could do it through LegalZoom. They streamline it for you a little bit. You could go online to the Patent Office website and file it there as well. <clears throat> uh, and I think the cost is $140, uh, or if you earn less than a certain amount of money, then it's uh, half of that. But anyway, uh, I think it's stronger to have a provisional application filed. You can say it's patent pending, and if you're going to disclose it to somebody, it's clear this is what I was exactly thinking of. Uh, and and non-disclosures can sometimes be hard to enforce. So, and, and it's scarier. You say if you disclose to somebody, saying you say, by the way, it's patent pending, they're like, oh, really? What you patent? And and that's that's great. I mean, if you have a patent pending, they don't know what you've patented. So that can sometimes scare people more than. You have a patent. Oh, well, I can look at the patent and try to design around it. Uh, if I don't know what you have and I'm going to invest a million dollars to develop this product, I may be subject to a lawsuit one day. I want to, you know, that can sometimes be scarier for people. Um, so, so me, again, we've gone through first the file system, so the date that you actually conceived of an invention is not as important anymore. It used to be uh, that we would base things on who invented it first. So you would, you know, things like mailing things to yourself could potentially, I mean, it, it's a combination of evidence. You know, you have receipts of things that you've bought. You know, you want to keep a log book and you put, put your receipts in there and you put all your thoughts in there and, and how you've gone about developing this and designing that. Um, and mailing it to yourself is just another piece of the evidence. Um, a couple of pitfalls also with, with companies is that, you know, if you're going to partner with another company or you want to partner with someone who isn't part of your business, they're a consultant or they're just a, another student who can help you out, well, if that, if that person contributes, conceives of something uh, that you end up putting in your patent application, they may be an inventor. And well, the way it works is you have to list the inventors who invent who invented this, and even if they're a 5% inventor or w invented 1% of it, you have to list them. And if they don't assign it to you, they own it with you. That means they can license people, they can practice it, they can do whatever they want without paying you anything. So you want to be very careful with that. Um, you know, anyone who is having software designed by, you know, you're going to go to India to have, to have them write the code for you. You want to make sure your agreement says, whatever you develop is owned by me. You are signing it to me, or my, hopefully my company, right? So, so that's very important. You want to avoid the lo loss of rights uh, in the event of a dispute. You want to look at your employment agreements, your consulting agreements, all that good stuff. So the question was about Zuckerberg. I watched the movie. It pissed me off a lot. Um, I think you know the whole the whole legal implication of that movie was 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 bad. Um, but I don't know if that's the truth, so I don't know how I can comment on it. But you know, essentially. But they were claiming to be partial Yeah. So the claim was that uh, the two guys he went to, and I forget their brothers' names, but yeah. So I mean, the problem with that that whole thing was that. You know, the movie made it sound like he just took their idea and went with it. Now, first off, you can only file an, a an application if you're the actual inventor. If you're not the inventor, if you just took someone else's idea. I had someone who came back from Europe, came, gave me this thing and said, I want to patent this. And I was like, um, you know, how do you design this? He said, I just bought it in Europe. But he, you're not the inventor, first off. And second off, <laughs> the sale itself was a prior art to you, so you can't get a patent. Um, 
So I'm not, I'm not really answering your question, but uh, there, are, there are a lot of things wrong with that movie, I thought, from a patent perspective. Yeah. Um, uh, you want to mark your patent, your products, of course. Uh, I'm going to skip through these. We'll, we'll skip over to trademarks because I think we're getting tight on time. Does anyone have any final questions on patents before we move on? And I want to encourage people, um, I don't know if you know, but I'm going to be giving away a few capital tickets afterwards. Some people walked in late. It, uh, we're, we're going to do the drawing just before class ends and put your name down on the thing and we'll, uh, we'll get it in. So trademarks. Um, everyone here, not everyone, but everyone here can use a trademark. And a trademark uh, can be a very powerful thing because no matter what you're doing, if you're making pizza, if you, make, if you have a service, if you have an auto mechanic store, whatever it is, you have a product, you're selling that product, you can use a trademark. <coughs> and, and you probably do have a trademark. You may have a trademark in common law rights. So a trademark, people see in the TM, and there's a services mark for services. You, you know, so if you're an auto mechanic shop or repair shop, you may have a service, but not a product. Um, and just about every company is using this. And, the thing is, you can apply for your trademark now before you start selling your product. Even if it's you know, a year before you start selling your product, it's better for you to do it now. That way, when you have the product, you know that you have the trademark tied up. So, um, so if you think about it, uh, this is, yes? Can you just give us an example of the services mark? Services yeah, so, so, so a trademark applies to uh, products. So if you're selling uh, a chair or a cookie or whatever it is. A service mark is if you're doing a service. So you're a consultant. If you're doing consultant work, um, you're not selling a product per se. You're selling the consulting services. If you're a therapist, if you're um, whatever it is, a, a design, if you, if you make designs, logos, or whatever. So it's, if it's you're doing a service, you're selling your own services, legal services, uh, you can get, it's, it's can still be called a trademark, but, tip, but uh, technically it's a service mark. But you still get an R in the circle. So, <clears throat> so uh, you know, if, if people can imagine uh, you draw, you're going on vacation, you're draw, going across country, or people are here from other countries, they've come here, and you, know, you get hungry, you're driving across country, you go, get hungry, and you see on the side of the road it says restaurants, and you see the big, right, the M, right? You see the big golden arches. And what does that do? What does that do? Why do people go there? What do you think? It, it's, a, it's a brand, right. You know what you're going to find at that restaurant. You're not going you're not, you're not to find uh, you know, a, fl a filet mignon, right? <laughs> you don't want that. You're looking for a Big Mac, which is a, a trademark. You, you're looking for something very specific. You know as a consumer that if you get off that exit and you go into that store, you're going to find what you're looking for. Right? And that is very powerful. You're walking down the, the, the aisle of the supermarket and you see Oreo on the cookie. You know what it's going to taste like. You know what it's not going to taste like. It's not going to be a Hydrox. You know what to expect. So it's it, the, the complicated explanation, I gave you the kindergartner explanation, the complicated explanation is that it's a source identifier. Now, what does that mean? So it identifies who's, it, it may, you may not know that the Oreo cookie is made by Nabisco, but you know it's come from the same place that all those other Oreos are that you've eaten that you shouldn't have. So, um, so it's a source identifier, and it's the same thing with you. It doesn't matter if you're selling one or a thousand. You want people to know, to be able to identify what you're doing by something, right? And you don't want them to call up and say, hey, give me two of those things. Well, yeah, that's your question. Be, like so the question is whether it could be a slogan, and, and yeah, it could be. Yeah. So um, a, there may be, and again, a trademark is something that's easy for you to do online. But I'll tell you, there are a lot of nuances to trademarks. I've filed hundreds of trademarks. I still ask questions of my partners because I'm you know, primarily on the patent side, but <clears throat> I still ask questions of my partners on the, uh, who do trademarks day in and day out 
because there's a lot of nuance to it. And um, again, you could do it yourself, but once you start building your company, you want to have a lawyer check into some of those things. Uh, another story I like, to so it, it's always better if your mark is arbitrary, if it's, if it's a descriptive mark, you know, you can't get a, a trademark chair if you're selling chair or, a seat or seats. Uh, but you can get chair if you're selling, um, you know, uh, glasses or something like that. So it can't be descriptive of the, the goods or services that you're using. So the question was whether a trademark can be owned by more than one person. I've never seen that. Um, you can own patents by more than one entity, and I, s I assume there's no reason you can't split a trademark. I mean, it's an asset like anything else. So you can draw an agreement to say whatever it is. So I mean, the best thing to do, and, and, I, and I tell this, if people, if there are two companies want to own the same patent or two companies want to own the same trademark, the best thing to do really is to have full ownership in one company and then have a licensing agreement to the other company saying, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. So, but whatever you do, whether it's owned by one or both, you need to have a very specific uh, agreement in place that says what are the rights and obligations of each. But I'm going to just kind of move on because uh, I think we're running at the end. Uh, but also think global. I know some people speak Spanish here. I, um, I don't know if they remember this. This is, dates me a lot. But Nova, Chevy, Chevy used to have a car called the Nova. And uh, you know everyone, you know, if you, even if you had a little Spanish, you, no means no, va means go. So Chevy filed their mark in, Spa in Spanish-speaking countries. Nova didn't sell very well because it meant the car didn't go anywhere. So you know it's just a kind of uh, shows you that you need to think on a global basis sometimes. Uh, and I will also say we've had situations where people have distributors in other countries. And uh, they have their trademark here. And I've had my clients ex experience this exact thing. I had a, an attorney in, um, I forget where it was, uh, uh, Portugal or somewhere. Um, and, and an attorney, you know, attorneys try to drum up business. So somebody was trying to register a trademark in their country. And they contacted me because they saw that in the US somebody owned it. Uh, and I went to my client and I said, do you know anything about this? What, is somebody's registering it? And most of the time it's nothing. But they said, you know what? The, this guy, we're doing business with this guy in Portugal. And, and he went out and he registered it for himself. And that's a real danger because if, you're, if you have a distributor in China, if it's made in China or, if, or elsewhere, um, if you, wherever you have a customer, distributor, marketer, whatever it is, apply for the trademark because if that relationship goes south, guess who owns it? Not you, and that's expensive. So, um, so you want to you want to do that. Copyrights, just really quickly, it protects an expression. It can be a book, a, a manual, a painting, a song, um, you know, anything, a photograph. Um, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about that. It protects the expression of the idea. There's information about trade secrets in there, but I'll, I'll leave it um, if anyone has any uh, questions or even afterwards you can feel free to call me. If you want my business card, I have business cards up here. Uh, if you didn't get a handout, I have the handout on the patent stuff. Um, and also if you want to put your name in for the CAPS tickets, just write your name up here. Are there any final questions before we wrap up? Answer one question. The slides are available on the GW Business Plan Competition website. Yes, yeah, so the slides are, I'll just repeat it slides for people who watch later, but slides are available on the, if you go to the GW Biz. It's bizplan.gwu.edu. Bizplan.gwu.edu, uh, and you could look for the presentations, or if you just Google GW Business Plan Competition, uh, you'll find the, the proper link. Uh, and this presentation will be there as well as the handout materials. Yes. I have a question about stock. So if it's a stock holding company, then it owners um,
everybody we talk to about this wants to buy in, which is wonderful on the one hand, but we don't want to lose control of the company before mm -hmm. we can really get going. Yeah. So how can we handle this? So, so the question, I don't want to, we only have a few minutes, so I don't want to get too, too tied up, but um, so the question was, you know, how, how do you distribute stock without losing controlling interest? And there are various things you can do to, to prevent yourself from, from your shares being divested. Maybe you have uh, voting shares, non-voting <coughs> shares, common stock, preferred stock. Um, so again, I don't, well, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, it, we can talk about what may be uh, the best for you to do. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming today. Thank you.